Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, all coming back here. Uh, uh, my name's Anatole Koletsky. Uh, I was for many years a journalist, but for the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, I've been uh, a, a professional economist in the way that an economist would define it, namely, I get paid for doing economics, therefore I must be an economist. <laughs> I, th I think that, that, uh, that's, uh, that's my uh, chief qualification. And uh, I'm, also, I'm, I'm the uh, co-chairman and one of, one of the three founders of, of a small business, uh, but I never uh, based now in Hong Kong, uh, that also has an operation in China, in Beijing, called Dragonomics, and so even I, in a small way could sympathize with some of the remarks uh, being made earlier about uh, both the opportunities but also some of the uh, difficulties of uh, operating uh, even very, very small uh, businesses with just about 50 employees ac across these uh, uh, le uh, legal, legislative, but also cultural uh, uh, barriers that, that, that still, of course, exist between the East and the West. Uh, now. Uh, the, uh, in, the, in the first two sessions, uh, there's been lots of uh, very justified praise uh, for the quality of the report that we've all uh, read on our iPads, although we haven't yet had, the, had them physically, and I don't uh, need to add to that. Uh, what I thought I would do, though, is also praise uh, the organization and the structure of, this, of the program here, because it strikes me that actually we've laid this out, or the organizers have laid this out in a very uh, logical, uh, coherent structure where we start off with the very big picture of you know, what's really going on between uh, our two parts of the world, uh, then move to trade investment, and now on to the next stage, uh, which, as Victor Chu reminded us, in some ways, I think, is the most important in the 21st century part of economic uh, interaction. As Victor said, uh, the most interesting part of, of the collaboration may be not the mutual trade or mutual investment, but where Chinese and European uh, enterprises, businesses actually work together to achieve common goals, both in their own set, uh, regions and in other regions all over the world. Uh, and the way that I had been thinking about the, uh, about introducing it before I heard uh, Victor's remark yesterday uh, uh, earlier uh, is that really the tra as tra trade and business interaction has moved from the 20th or the 19th to the 20th to the 21st century. Uh, we've seen uh, a shift from the exchange of goods, the mutual, mutually beneficial exchange of goods, you know, in exchange for uh, financial incentives, to the mutually beneficial exchange in services. But now the trade of the 21st century is largely going to be about the mutually beneficial exchange of ideas, of knowledge, of data. This is the next logical stage from goods to services to knowledge and ideas, and that's really, I think, what we're going to uh, talk about in this panel. And it's very and it's very useful uh, that it was addressed in such a significant part of the report. I think it's also very useful the way that really it, uh, the report focused on three areas where this uh, exchange in ideas uh, and uh, knowledge uh, are going to be most intense over the coming uh, years and decades, namely energy and climate change, where there is now an obvious, as the report says, an obvious community of interest specifically between the European Union and China, uh, and which for the first time really uh, relegates the United States to a secondary rather than a primary leading player. This is uh, really a first in the, uh, in the at least recent history of international economic relations. So there's energy and climate change. Secondly, and ultimately even more importantly, uh, there's scientific and technical knowledge, and we have a number of re real experts on, in that uh, around the table. And thirdly, there is 
the uh, cooperation in finance. Uh, and those are the three sections in the report which I would strongly recommend you all look at. I'm not going to say anything more about any of them because I think we want to maximize the time for the panelists and for a really uh, fruitful exchange with the audience. So now I'd like to you know, hand over to each of the panelists. They're all going to talk about different aspects of this, uh, and then we'll try and uh, open it up and also bring it together in the discussion. So uh, perhaps, Hannah, you could start. We'll go from left to right. Uh, try to confine yourself to 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> if possible, or slightly less. Hannah is the representative of the BDI of German industry in Beijing, has been there for about two years, and I think is an ideal way to, uh, person to start this off. Thank you very much for having me. Um, congratulations on that excellent report. Um, I was very, very impressed to read that very knowledgeable report, and I was also very impressed to hear that I was not even born when uh, Jean-Claude uh, negotiated <laughs> <laughs> the first bilateral treaty, but <clears throat> whatever. Um, if it comes to age, the BDI office in Beijing is rather young as well. We had our first uh, anniversary yesterday. And uh, so we opened up an office in China last year, and um, the decision from BDI to uh, why we wanted to have an office there is if it comes to innovation and uh, cooperation in the field of industry, you need to be on the ground, you need to talk to the people, not about the people. Um, so this was one of the main reason, one of the main reasons why we really decided to go there. Um, I think still in German industry, I mean, for the German industry, China is one of the biggest markets. Uh, we have a lot of trade, we have a lot of investments, we have a lot of cooperation in the field of innovation. But still, I think we tend to talk a lot about China, but not with China. So I think this is one of the main um, assets of this report, that you made the effort and you said it was sometimes it was really, really exhausting. And I can, I can imagine that, but I think it was worth it to have different partners from different backgrounds. And this is what we are basically doing there as well. There in the Beijing office is to talk to people, to talk to think tanks, to ministries about what's really going on. Because I think if we really want to see where we have some opportunities uh, to go one step further in the field of innovation and cooperation, we need to know what's going on. Um, in your report, one of your recommendations, um, if it comes to uh, cooperation in the field of innovation, was the exchange of people. And I could not agree more to that. So my first, uh, my personal experience with China uh, was I, I went there to study there, and this is where, where I get to know, uh, to learn about China. And I think if we talk about innovation, it starts with people, it starts with ideas, and the exchange of ideas. So I think we should um, promote that also from the point um, of the of business point of view. We, we should really more um, have more exchange. So this is, is really my, my personal experience. Um, I mean, we had like the, the panels and, and the report it was a lot about um, potential and opportunities and I would I couldn't agree more on that too, that there is a lot of potential, but my job being a lobbyist is of course to pour a little cold water into the wine. <laughs> so normally I, I don't get a call from companies telling me, wow, everything's perfect. I just want to let you know you that. So normally people call me when they have a problem or to talk about challenges <clears throat> in their work. Um, so just a few points on industrial cooperation and innovation from a business point of view. I think there are tremendous opportunities and I think the times are over where we could allow ourselves to talk about China like we wait until China is on eye level or something like that. There are a lot of fields where China is way ahead of us. So every time I come back to Europe and I have to pay with paper money, I'm like, what? <laughs> So there are different um, areas like fintech, e-commerce. There's so much going on and I think, I, I mean, I, I speak for the German industry. I'm not quite sure that um, smaller companies, SMEs, are really aware of what's going on in China and there, there are a lot of opportunities and challenges, but you have to be on the ground to see what's going on and to be part of that development. Um, so this 
said, said this um, about the opportunities, there are some barriers we have to tackle and I, I want to share just a few examples. Um, I think one of the main thing for good cooperation in the field of innovation is uh, framework conditions. Um, if there are no good framework conditions, then there won't be um, a cooperation. I, we have a lot of talk with the Chinese side, with the ministries, um, with think tanks about the whole thing about Industry 4.0 and Made in China 2025. And I'm always sitting in those meetings and we have very different ways of thinking and how we handle things. So normally the Germans are always talking about framework conditions and data security and we have to talk, we have, we need a framework before we start to work. Then we have the Chinese side. They are always telling us, okay, let's just start it. Let's do some pilot projects and then we'll see. And then, yeah, there will be some problems, but we can handle it on the way. And I think both sides have to step, you know, we have to meet us in the middle um, and see what we can do about that. I think we, we should really have more exchange about that and we, we really need to, to learn from each other. I think it, it might be a chance. Um, the second thing is, um, which is I think the most important thing for a good cooperation and a fair cooperation is the predictability of legal decisions. And this is something where we have a lot of concerns and worries at the moment. Uh, I can give you another example about that. Uh, China released on the 1st of June a cybersecurity law. And uh, the weeks after that, <laughs> I uh, received a lot of calls um, from companies, foreign companies, asking me, we don't understand it, it's not clear, and are we still compliant? And just to make it sure, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong about a cybersecurity law. Most countries have a cybersecurity law. Um, but you really have to communicate to the business, um, not just foreign companies, but also Chinese companies. We, we don't know if we are compliant, and this is not good for cooperation if you don't know, am I still allowed to do that? Am I not allowed to do that? Um, so we really need clear standards and rules. Um, another example, if it comes to predictability of legal decisions, was uh, at the uh, end of last year, beginning of this year, that uh, German companies were not able to transfer the money out of the country. This is not good in terms of rule of law, and this is not good for the investment climate. So this is something where we need more communication from both, both sides. Um, so now I need, I need to <laughs> have a good thing to, to end it. So th this is... Um, just, just a few maybe points from, from the business point of view where we could maybe have a little bit more talk about, or I think we should uh, talk about that. But besides, um, besides that, there is a lot of good cooperation between the companies, and I think the companies and industry sometimes is faster than um, the governments. So I can see that every day in the area of Industry 4.0, there are a lot of good corporations, for example, between uh, SAP and Huawei and Siemens. And um, it's our job, I mean, it's my job working for business federation to make sure that the framework conditions are, are good, um, that they improve. And um, yeah, so having said that, I love to live in <coughs> Beijing. <laughs> And um, it's, it's, uh, every day I see something, something new and, and the development of China in the field of industry and innovation is, is tremendously fast and um, it's a great opportunity for me to be part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, I think that those are very important observations that uh, in order to foster and really uh, get the full benefits of uh, intellectual collaboration. You need uh, even more than the quality of the intellects on both sides, or just as much as the quality of the intellects and ideas on both sides and their complementarity. You need this concept of framework conditions, uh, conditions where people can work together, where institutions can work together, where laws, and crucially laws and institutions are not the same thing, where laws can get together and a willingness, as you said, for attitudes to meet 
somewhere in between rather than, and of course, you know, Germans find this problem, I think, not just with the Chinese, but even with the British, uh, not to mention the Russians, you know, but never, but uh, it's this, it's this, uh, these framework conditions, I think, are very important. Uh, now let's uh, turn to Tony Graziano, who uh, is right in the middle of these uh, complicated uh, framework conditions as a European working for Huawei, which I guess must be the largest or certainly one of the largest uh, hardware as well as software businesses in, in China, yes? Um, yes, it is, and uh, maybe I will g I will go into some details at uh, later on. Before I, uh, before that, I would like to again um, associate myself in uh, complementing the four um, uh, institution in uh, uh, complementing them on the excellent uh, report. I was trying to identify some attribute which I think would distinguish my comment on what has been said already. And I came up with uh, maybe the report, I think it's a, it's a, it's a sober, it's a factual, but also it's a, a balanced um, snapshot, I think, of the current EU-China uh, cooperation. And I think because it also provides uh, um, policy indication as to what needs to be done in order to address some of the challenges and also uh, ensure that we uh, really gain uh, benefit from the um, opportunities. It does provide, it, it can, could be used as a uh, reference uh, document for the, for the EU uh, Commission, uh, which I think I strongly advise them uh, to do that. Um, there are a couple of um, uh, observations that I would like to make to the report, uh, possibly three, but before I go into that, if you allow me, I would like to maybe to say a few words about uh, uh, Huawei, the uh, company, uh, in terms of who we are, what we do, and how we do it, uh, the uh, uh, business. You rightly said that uh, companies, um, Huawei is a, is a global company, is a global high city uh, company. We employ more than 180,000 people, and we operate in over 170 countries uh, worldwide. Um, we operate in three business areas, the telecommunication uh, network, which represents our core business, and for which we get 60% of our global uh, revenue, but also um, consumer devices and enterprises. Um, there are two important aspects which are often not uh, widely publicized, but also known, by the public um, in general, that distinguishes our company for maybe our, our peers. The first and most important one is that Huawei is a, a private company. It's a company that is entirely owned by its employee. Uh, we have 180,000 people, and 85,000 of those people own the company. The biggest sh shareholder is our uh, president and uh, founder, and he only has 1.4% of the, of the shares. The rest is evenly spread among uh, the others. The other important aspect, which I think you know, fits in maybe with the discussion that we are having uh, today, of the 180,000 employees, 45%, uh, that's roughly 80,000 people, are engaged in R&D. And that is obviously supported by the fact that we on average, spends between 12 and 15 percent of our global revenue on R&D. Just to give you an indication, in 2016, our global revenue was just over 75 billion U.S. dollars, and that was, and we spent just over 10 billion U.S. dollar on uh, R&D. So that gives you an indication of the uh, capacity, but also of the potential that uh, our uh, company has. In terms of uh, our presence here in, uh, in Europe, we have been in Europe now since uh, 2000. We now employ just over 11,000 people. And again, I think what we are doing globally is very much reflected in our business approach to Europe. In Europe, we have um, established 1818 R&D sites in eight European countries. 
and these are sites which you know, develop the technology that we are going to sell globally. Um, coming back to the observation about the report, and again, I think this is a more of a, a personal um, observation, an observation that I've noted uh, over the past six years that I, I've been working with uh, uh, Huawei. And I've seen a number of uh, reports that try to address the intricacy of the EU-China relation, you know, in trying to provide maybe uh, recommendation and, and aspect. And invariably, I think, one of the points that, that is often overlooked and missed, it's an analysis of the, what I call it, historical baggage that each side bring to their um, discussion. Because I think that is very, very important to analyze in order to better understand why each side is uh, making a particular choice and also why they are trying to go in a particular direction. But also I think it does provide um, an opportunity to address some of the misconception and mistrust that I often heard and experienced between you and China, which it has often frustrated the discussion between the two sides. So I think maybe this is an area which I've noted. It has been addressed lightly in the, in the report, but I do believe it plays an important role in better understanding the two sides. The other point that I wanted to make, and I think this is linked to obviously the business that my company is in, and that is uh, ICT. Because I believe, well, we all agree that I think EU-China rep represents a major um, opportunity. Uh, I mean, if we were to step up the cooperation between the two in developing a strategic uh, partnership, I, I think we can all benefit. Now, we need to find the, long, the, uh, the link, that element, which I think will bring everything together. And in my view, the ICT can play that, that role. Because I, I do believe there is uh, considerable alignment. I mean, if we look at the ICT on both sides, the nature of the ICT in the EU, for example, the ICT is, um, you know, can be characterized in the EU as being mature. It has got uh, great talent. It has got great R&D capacity. It has uh, a leadership in, in terms of regulation, but also in terms of services, which I think will be crucial in the partnership between EU and China. And lastly, but not least, uh, it, it, it also, um, provides, I, I think it's, it's um, well, if we, if we look at the, at the Chinese side, then I think we can, we can see that uh, the, although they are slightly different, it can be, it's, it's quite um, uh, complementary. Because uh, again, China, um, it's a, a maturing sector. Um, it has got a great uh, uh, human potential. But also, it has got something which I think many companies aspire to access, and that is the ICT penetration is not as much as what uh, one can see in the in view. And in that sense, I think there is quite a lot of uh, um, opportunity from a, a company uh, business uh, perspective. And I think. The aspect, maybe the point that could bring that together from an IC uh, perspective, it's uh, the 5G development, the fifth uh, generation network development. Because I, again, I've been working on this now for quite some, some time, and I've noted that there is considerable alignment between EU and China in the approach on how 
to bring to fruition this fifth uh, generation uh, uh, network communication. Um, I mean, if we look at the way that uh, um, Europe is uh, uh, progressing certainly on uh, 5G, they do not see 5G as, uh, uh, again, an extension of the current 3G or 4G communication system. They see 5G as uh, an opportunity to maybe to use ICT in maybe in those vertical sectors. Um, and if we look at the strength of Europe, Europe by far has got the greatest strength in terms of the vertical in, um, industry. Uh, you know, the financial sector, the car industry, the um, uh, health system. So you can see that, you know, the strength of Europe on one side com commiserated by the, the, the strength of uh, um, China on the, on the other side can definitely provide the basis uh, for this uh, cooperation to, uh, to thrive. Um, one last comment, just uh, before I, 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 I conclude. And I think this refers to the comments that uh, were made by uh, Anne before with regard to the uh, people exchange. Uh, we as a company strongly believe in that. And back in 2011, I think we were first, uh, the first company that engaged or established um, what we call it the Seeds of the Future program. This is a, a program whereby we um, uh, work with um, national or local uh, university. And the, and the idea is to bring uh, undergraduate students to China for, first of all, to uh, get an induction about, the, about China. But most importantly, for them to have a hands-on experience about the ICT, the potential that ICT provides in terms of jobs, but also in, in terms of business, and maybe and how that could, could bridge this uh, divide between the two. Now, the program now is running in 60 countries globally. In Europe, it's running in 23 countries. And so far, we have had 700 European undergraduate students visiting our facility in China. And the plan is for us to have, you know, a, in the region of 1,500, 2,000 students visiting our facility in China by 2020. And on that note, I would like to conclude. Well, thank you very much. I think, uh, I think that, that, that uh, intervention raised many interesting issues, but two in particular I, I, I would highlight, uh, which are related. Uh, throughout this discussion this morning, the elephant in the room, or actually more accurately, the elephant outside the room has been the United States. And it's very interesting that in the discussion of 5G and ICT cooperation and so on, uh, we haven't mentioned the United States. And I think that's in some ways appropriate, because I said in my introduction, there's a convergence of interest on energy and climate, but there's also potentially a convergence of interest uh, between Europe and China on uh, the next stage of uh, a information technology as well, because we have a situation that's developed over the last 15 years where a great deal of the technological innovation is still coming, or perhaps more than ever coming from China, and still coming from Europe. Uh, and yet the systems integration and the business benefits of that have been, especially in this last 3G, 4G phase, very much dominated by the United States, whereas previously, you know, standard setting and so, so on and so forth uh, tended to diffuse that. So I think that's a very interesting uh, in a way, similarity potentially between ICT and even energy and climate change. The last point that Tony mentioned was about the people-to-people -people exchange. Now, one of the striking things when you go to Silicon Valley is that about a quarter of a third of the people there are Chinese, not just ethnically Chinese, but Chinese from China. And then another quarter of a third are Indians from India. And that is something that we in Europe have not yet uh, developed to nearly the same extent. Uh, 
and I suppose talking of higher education universities, that's a very appropriate uh, point to uh, move to Larry Lau, who uh, all of us know, he's an old friend and participant in, in, this, uh, in, in this exercise, in the study, and I'd love to hear your uh, summary remarks on everything we've talked about. Uh, uh, thank you, Anatoly, and, uh, and I actually want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Guntram <laughs> for Prugo, and also and Robin, uh, for Chatham House, and also Yan Sung with the CCI Yi Yi. I think uh, uh, I'm very pleased that this project has finally <laughs> been able to issue this report. It's really, a, a, uh, I think it's really an accomplishment. Uh, thank you. Um, I think there are many opportunities for innovation and industrial cooperation and collaboration between the EU and China. The EU is higher than China in terms of achieved levels of science and technology. Moreover, the EU has been devoting more resources in R&D than China, both historically and currently. The EU aims to achieve an R&D to GDP ratio of 3% by 2020, um, whereas China only aims to achieve 2.5% by 2020. And given that the EU GDP is about uh, one and a half times the Chinese GDP, so by year 2020, the EU's R&D expenditure uh, will be 70% higher, 75% higher than that of China. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, China has been trying to pay catch up in R&D. She is now the world's leader in terms of the number of scientific papers published and the number of patents granted uh, yeah, annually. Um, the average quality, of course, another issue we can discuss here. Um, but China also has two advantages as a huge market which really means that the cost of discoveries and inventions can be more easily amortized uh, over uh, this large market. Um, and, uh, and it also has an abundance of relatively low cost scientific and technical manpower. Uh, as you know, the scale of the market is critical to the success, to the commercial success of innovation. And this is one of the reasons why the US has been so successful uh, commercially, so much more in innovation than perhaps even the, the EU. Moreover, the proportion of total expenditures devoted to basic research in China today is very low. It's around 5%. This is um, to basic research. Um, uh, by comparison, uh, you know, the, uh, it is about 15% for the UK in basic research and around 20% for Germany and for the United States. But we all know that basic research is critical. It's really critical for breakthrough uh, innovation. If you don't have basic research, uh, you, can never, you can never do that. Um, uh, so there can be significant gains, I think, to both the EU and China from the mutual cooperation collaboration R&D, which exploits both the complementarity that I talk about um, between them, but also achieve risk sharing and diversification at the same time. Because you know, R&D is a risky uh, uh, endeavor, and the more you can uh, share, the better. Um, the challenge is, of course, in the mutual explicit recognition and protection of each other's intellectual property rights, which we spend some time to discuss. And this is critical. Um, the uh, Chinese protection of intellectual property rights, both domestic and foreign, has improved significantly uh, since 2013 has continued to actually to improve. This is an inevitable consequence of China turning into also a creator of intellectual, intellectual property uh, rather than only a user of intellectual property. So it has an incentive to protect uh, uh, intellectual property. One can also distinguish between public sector and private sector co cooperation and collaboration in innovation activities. Public sector cooperation and collaboration takes place between governments and other public organizations, whereas private cooperation and collaboration would typically take place between profit-making enterprises. Now, we should make that a distinction. Public sector cooperation and collaboration is driven by perceived public need, whereas private sector cooperation and collaboration is motivated by potential profits. So that is actually important. Basic research is therefore an area in which both the EU and China can cooperate and collaborate successfully because there's not as much conflict of commercial or other interests. Um, the results of such research can be jointly owned or be put into public domain. Um, CERN, C-E-R-N, 
is actually a very successful example of international collaboration in R&D in the basic research. Yeah, extremely successful. Um, the um, the uh, discoveries are sufficiently far removed from commercial exploitability uh, that the appropriate assignment of intellectual property rights is not a contentious issue. I mean, the, having discovered the Higgs boson doesn't do, really do anything uh, to anyone's profit. Um, but it is critical for going forward. Um, the, uh, uh, I think I believe China already has a cooperation agreement with CERN. I think another possible focus is uh, space exploration. Uh, space exploration. I believe that China, um, the, uh, there's really uh, space exploration that is not related to military use. There is no need for the EU and China to duplicate the efforts in this field. Uh, in a couple of years, I think China will become the only country with a working space station uh, in space for at least a while. Uh, China is also ahead in research in a few limited areas, such as quantum communication, genomics, and supercomputers, areas in which cooperation and collaboration uh, can be very promising. Now, historically, the ties between European and Chinese academics actually were, were strong. There is a mathematical mathematician, Chinese mathematician, Professor uh, S.S. Chen, which some of you might know. Um, he is one of the foremost mathematicians of the 20th century. He studied in Hamburg uh, in 1934 and Paris in 1936. And, and a leading Chinese nuclear physicist, um, um, Professor Chen, San Qiang, he actually st studied under Frédéric uh, Juliot <laughs> and Madame <laughs> Uh, uh, Curie, uh, Jurek Curie in France uh, before going back uh, to China. And some of you may know that the, uh, the late Premier Zhou Enlai, Zhou Enlai and also the late Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping, they both spent time uh, in the 20s uh, in both in France and also uh, for Zhou also in Germany. So these ties are, are long and I think it's time maybe we could try to how to revive that uh, in, in terms of academic cooperation. And one uh, important potential area of cooperation is in the patenting process. Uh, I think reciprocal recognition by the EU and China of each other's patents is a rather distant goal. Uh, we shouldn't <laughs> try to push it yet. But it is possible to facilitate the patent application process by the national of both the EU and China in each other by basically for each side accepting the working papers, the working paper, technical papers submitted to each other, to, to the domestic uh, patent organization, just you know, say that those could also be accepted uh, when you apply, let's say a European applies a Chinese patent, he can use the, uh, what he used for the Euro European application uh, as part of the uh, submission. I think that would basically uh, facilitate uh, a, a, a great deal. Now, but my understanding is that currently there's no uniform patent procedure across the EU. <laughs> I think if that's true, I don't know if it's true or not, I mean, it's high time that the EU adopt a uniform patent process so that uh, you know, a Chinese inventor doesn't have to apply in all 28 or 27 uh, member states. Um, the uh, prevention of climate change, I'll turn to coming to the end, and decarbonization is another promising area for deep collaboration. Both the EU and China are committed to full implementation of the Paris Agreement. The EU can share with China its extensive experience on carbon trading and a carbon tax. You know, China is about to engage in the carbon trading. The EU and China can also jointly conduct and support research on, for example, uh, fusion power, new battery technology, promotion of use of heat pumps, of which I found the EU is the leader, uh, lowering the cost of long distance transmission electricity and phasing out of coal. I think all, the, all of these are uh, important areas where they could uh, share. Um, uh, like uh, we mentioned already, the sh sh uh, setting of standards of 5G, but electric cars, <laughs> standards for electric cars, that's extremely important because I, think, I believe that there are calls now for phasing out the internal combust combustion engine in both the EU and China by 2040. It's not that far away. <laughs> 2040 is around the corner, especially if you have to invest in the, uh, in, in the new manufacturing facilities for electric car. 
High-speed railroads is actually an example of very successful industrial co collaboration between uh, German enterprise and Chinese enterprises. And I believe it has proved to be very beneficial for both sides, for Siemens and, and for the Chinese railroad company. Um, there is now a growing market for high-speed railroads in the rest of the world. I think the continued cooperation would be possible. The other thing is the, in the uh, design and manufacture of commercial aircrafts. Um, you know, especially with China being a huge market over the next several decades. And I think the Airbus already has assembly plant in China. And, um, and there could also be, uh, I, I don't want to take the time, but there could be a lot of room for co collaboration and cooperation between made in China 2025 and Industry 4.0. I think, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, other possible, uh, turning to uh, finally to, uh, uh, to the finance area, I think, I think it is possible to consider the listing of shares of EU enterprise on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, say, uh, for example, on the international board, and for Chinese enterprise to list on European stock exchanges. The goal is really to create my, 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 my you can say my dream, <laughs> my goal, is to create joint EU Chinese enterprises that are similar to Royal Dutch Shell and Unilever. I mean, they are just joint Anglo-Dutch companies. I mean, there's no reason why you cannot have joint Chinese-German <laughs> companies. I mean, you know, I think that would be good because that would make it much less important to focus on the national origin or national ownership of, industry, of uh, individual enterprises. China can also help to make it easier for European uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to share in the growth of a domestic market, this has been mentioned already. Finally, I think cybersecurity is an urgent area <laughs> that will require the attention of both uh, EU and China, and that's an area that uh, is ripe for cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, Larry. As, as I expected, that, that was a fantastic lead, inspiring uh, list of potentially uh, exciting but also highly profitable and uh, investable opportunities for, for the two sides to cooperate. Uh, but just to bring the discussion full circle, in a sense, uh, when one hears a list of opportunities like that, which, you know, with all respect, many of which are pretty obvious, uh, the question then arises, why have they not already been seized? And that really goes back to where Hannah began this discussion, uh, that we must not overlook the uh, obstacles that by definition must be in the path of all these opportunities, otherwise they would already have been seized. So I'm not going to say any more. We've got 20 minutes left, but I would very much uh, encourage uh, people who want to ask questions and, and make comments uh, and not to skirt away from uh, the problems which must be out there and we all need to talk about, uh, frankly, amongst ourselves. Uh, so who, who, who would like to... Uh, r make the first remark or raise the first question. Okay, we'll start with Robin. I'll try to warm warm things up a little bit. Um, and some of this is drawn from uh, some of the commentary you made in the last panel. I think it's good to be able to link these together because this was a we were getting into some really quite interesting granular ideas from each of the presentations we just had. Um, but two things. I wanted to pick up actually uh, Ian Davis's remark earlier about the importance of data sharing, which is something that maybe we didn't uh, address as much in our science and technology section as we did other uh, issues. But um, I'd be fascinated, Tony or Hannah in particular, companies working across different jurisdictions looking to expand and deepen that, and you said you're in the amount of countries that uh, Huawei are, are based in, we do know that governments are actually getting more protective about how data is managed, where it's stored, the rules, I'm talking about framework conditions, to, as Hannah put it, we know this is an impact on the US-EU relationship, as I was being reminded by Gunter a minute ago, of course it'll be a big thing in the EU-UK uh, relationship as well in the future, but where does that stand in the China-EU relationship getting better, or is it one of the areas that might get more complicated going forward? And if it does, what might you do to, to, to mitigate it? I could tie that in a little bit to um, university collaboration. I think, Larry, you're here. There's, again, just to 
talk about the, the, the grit in the oyster as well as the taste of the oyster, there is the commentary that um, things are tightening up at Chinese universities, mainland universities in particular, attitudes to Western education. Now, that may be more political, maybe it isn't getting in the way of sharing data, but there's a very interesting chart in the report, I was trying to find the page, I haven't found it quite now. In any case, there's a very interesting chart in the report, full report, if you go to it, showing um, the extent to which uh, scientific papers are written between Chinese and European or American. And the difference between 2000 and 2013, I think, was the data. It hasn't changed that much. Still, the bulk of joint scientific papers tend to be written by Americans with Europeans, Europeans with Americans, a bit of Japanese in there, and a smidge of China. Um, so if we're talking about sharing ideas, again, I don't know, any experience, maybe, Larry, this is more in, in your space, but any thoughts? Um, and maybe so you could say something on people to people, work visas. Is this a big issue, Hannah, for, for German industry or Tony for, again, companies working across? Or is that really not a big topic? Uh, we listed it as look how much more people to people exchange there is. And we said the great thing about science and, te no, science and technology, we said in the report, is that it's not about you know, sharing markets is about sharing people. And as you said, Antle, at the beginning, that's the future, maybe. But that requires the movement of people. How's it looking? So well, well, points. well, Robin, uh, uh, as one might have predicted, you've raised so many questions, we could easily start all over again with another. But uh, rather than spending 10 minutes each, which you would need for, to answer all those questions, just pick uh, one or two points, maybe, you know, in a, a minute each. Again, let, let's start with Hannah, yeah. Okay, maybe then I start with the last question. Um, people to people exchange and um, actually it is a big problem um, in terms of visa um, on both sides. I, I have to be honest on that point on both sides. Uh, we see that in the field of internships that it's hard. And um, another thing, I'm, I've been living in Beijing for two years now and um, a lot of German companies are complaining right now and also the German embassy that it's not hard to find people willing to move to Beijing because of the uh, life quality there. Um, and I mean, the air quality is one thing, um, but the restriction on VPN, for example, is another thing which is really like harming uh, the quality of living in, in Beijing or in China at the moment. So um, it is hard to, to find people. I, I still think it's one of the most interesting places to work and live. This is one reason why I live there. Um, but there could be, uh, there, there needs to be done a lot of uh, improvement uh, on, on both sides. I think the point maybe I would like to, to look into is the data um, protection server security aspect because I think you raise a very Im important point. I think the sharing of data is going to play a key part in the development of uh, 5G because I think one of the key of 5G, as I, as I already mentioned, is how we can horizontalize the vertical sector. I'm not so sure whether that makes... Please explain. <laughs> well, <laughs> because currently I think the, um, each sector is uh, operating in, in, a, in a silo. The car sector, the financial sector, the health sector. And I do believe that there is some benefits that one can gain in sharing the data across the different sector. Um, now, at the moment, there are regulations that to some extent prevent that. There are local regulations that prevent that. But also, again, linked to the cybersecurity and data security, I think, there are starting to develop international law, which I think does kind of prevent this share of, uh, of information. Um, again, I think it's an opportunity. Uh, there is a big danger of maybe moving into the wrong direction, especially, you know, if we consider some of the protectionist statements that I, I believe have been made in the U.S., but also in the EU, you know, America first, EU first kind of, kind of thing. That then, you know, we need to move away from that. Maybe we need to step up and try to see the benefits that one can gain in sharing data rather than maybe being bogged down by the maybe 
complexity that one can see at the, um, uh, at the moment. So I, th I think we need to see a, a little bit beyond that. Cyber security, again, I think maybe this is a, a discussion that we need to be done in a, in a different context. And I think when I was alluding to the historical baggage, this is one of the areas that I was, um, you know, I, I had in mind. Because currently, I think there is very much um, a sense of distrust between some key regions. And I think this all stems from, like I said, this historical baggage. It's very likely that the EU agrees with the US. But I feel that there is quite a lot of, you know, uh, there is a, a big challenge if we can say the same about you and, Ch and, Ch and China. So I think we need to find a way that maybe we move beyond that. Um, whether that is going to be possible in, in the near future, I'm not so sure. But I think let's try to be, again, and maybe refer to the way that the Chinese look at it. They're very problematic in a way of solving a problem. You know, If we look at the EU, the EU, if they try to solve a problem, they always start, start uh, from a holistic approach, yeah? China, it's very much focused, okay, there is a problem, let's try to focus on this problem. Let's try to solve the problem. And there may be out of that, there may be the side effects that we may address the bigger picture. So really, that's, uh, the, this is the difficulty that, um, that I see. And uh, lastly, on people-to-people -people exchange, this is becoming a problem for us as a company to try to identify the right talent. Uh, and I think it would be good, and again, I think I, I agree with what uh, Hans said, maybe we need to look at the visa system that we are uh, operating in Europe, because I do believe there is quite a lot that we can gain by maybe the, the talent that uh, is in, uh, in the other regions. Okay, uh, just, uh, I can't resist uh, abusing my position here and just asking you a question to follow up on that, which I'd like really a one-word answer, but uh, uh, relating to the last point that Larry made in his first presentation, uh, which is about the ideal of a Sino-European company one day coming uh, into being similar to, with, with the same degree of mutual uh, ownership and mutual trust as a, as a Royal Dutch Shell, uh, which would begin to, you know, which would be a way of addressing these people to people and also looking at it one problem at a time, as you said. Could you imagine in the next 10 years Huawei becoming a Sino-European company? Yes or no? <laughs> uh, uh, Just yes or no. The answer would be no, simply because I think we are a private company and there is no um, intention, certainly for the foreseeable future, for the company to become public. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, actually, I think it's more likely that uh, VW, uh, if it wants to, can really become a Sino-German company because it already has so much operation in, in China itself. But anyway, I, I would be brief, I know we went out of time. Um, um, I'm all for people to people exchange, but I want to say something based on our experience of our last report. You know, uh, three or four years ago, um, we also collaborated with uh, CCIEE and CSIS in the US to produce a report called uh, China-U.S. Economic Relations 2022. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, anyway, um, the, uh, uh, we made a recommendation then that actually, uh, actually somehow got adopted. Um, and the result was that on, on visas, and the result was that today, China and the U.S. has they, they issue to each other 10-year multiple entry visas. And in one fell swoop, it really, I mean, it simplifies things. Students can travel back and forth, go home for vacation. They don't have to worry about getting the visa. Um, you know, businessmen, it used to be you have to get a letter of invitation <laughs> before you can even start to apply for a visa. And now you get a 10-year multiple entry visa, you don't need it anymore. I think that is really something that I think is doable. Um, you know, you don't have to grant the visa, but for people who qualify, you should grant mutually, you know, a 10-year multiple entry visa. I think that would be just 
Fantastic. Um, you know, Europe is actually a great place. A lot of Chinese tourists like to come to Europe, but you cannot see Europe in one trip, right? <laughs> too big a place, too different a place. So you give them a 10-year multiple entry visa, and they can visit all 27 or 28 of the EU member states, you know, in, within the next 10 years. Um, my second point is really has to do with, uh, I think, what uh, Robin asked about um, I think I think it really has to do coming uh, on the quality of uh, maybe as uh, Grinchum on the quality of uh, Chinese uh, publications, scientific publications, and and it is actually um, the average quality is not that high, uh, not because I say so, but if you look at the citation index, you will find that the uh, uni uniformly uh, they are not cited very often, even though there's a lot, very large number of publications. Um, this goes back to what I said earlier, and that is you really need people to do more uh, basic research, more creative research, more breakthrough research, because otherwise um, you, you really cannot produce results um, that uh, really, you know, that will turn on the, <laughs> uh, your view, turn the view on. Um, I, I am reflecting that uh, uh, the East Asians, not just Chinese, East Asians, I think they are too respectful of authority. That is, no one would think of writing a paper saying that my teacher was wrong, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, and that's exactly what Einstein did to Newton, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you really have to do that. And I think the Chinese are most reluctant. I mean, maybe for cultural and other reasons. And that is really why if you look at the Nobel laureates of Chinese ethnic origin, um, I would say that almost all of them uh, with, the with the exception of the most recent one who got the uh, uh, medicine prize. And more, almost all of them were trained overseas. Yeah, they did their work overseas. So, and, and that is an environment in which they could actually be more creative, you know, think more freely and so forth. And I, think, I think that's important. So anyhow, thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we haven't got much time left. We've got five or maybe if we overrun uh, a little 10 minutes left. Uh, I've got uh, two w w questions or remarks here. Uh, any, any others? I think w what I'll do is get a few remarks from the floor and then uh, the panel can respond to all of them. Well, there has been already very interesting presentation comments, so I will uh, ask a more precise question uh, once to Huawei and also maybe a comment to the very interesting presentation of uh, uh, Laurie. Uh, the question to Huawei is, we heard that for the future, uh, data is a bit the resources of the future. And to use data, you need uh, confidence. And then we, as we have discussed us now, we are confronted with different legislation. So for using data in China, you are obliged to store data in China. Huawei is an international company, so you are confronted with different legislation. How you judge uh, this obligation for a company also using data and developing very much towards cloud services, which is based on data, this obligation to make sure the data which you use in China is stored in China? And how do you see your competitors affected uh, by this obligation? Uh, then concerning patents, uh, you mentioned uh, that it would be good to have uh, a possibility uh, to have an easy way to European patents. There may be Huawei can already give you advice because concerning the EU patent, you are right that there are national patents, which are complicated. But we have the EU patent system, and there Huawei is amongst the five biggest uh, patent uh, holders. So there the company is already very successful. You mentioned also this very interesting area to work more closely with genomics. Uh, and in Shenzhen is one of the three leading worldwide com companies on genomics. But there's also the question of ethics. And if we come to ethics, it's then the question also of uh, rule, of rule of law and security. So my question to you is a bit uh, how you judge the development of rule of law, which assures that certain principles are respected in China as in other parts of the world. Great. 
Thank you. And one here. Any others? Okay. Uh, but just a very quick comment to, to echo some of the things that have been said. So, so um, I just wanted to refer to uh, to recent paper by my colleague Reinhilde Vöglas on China as a science and technology powerhouse, which sort of summarizes and gives some of the of the statistics. And so one of the points she makes is that already now uh, there are more PhDs in, uh, in natural sciences and engineering uh, in, in China than in the United States. And she also makes the very important point that, uh, in fact, the lead that the United States has in a number of areas in university research, it can hold only because of uh, all the Chinese uh, graduates um, uh, and young, uh, talented researchers that come. And I, I guess what I would suggest is that the European Union develops a proactive agenda in actually developing a mutually beneficial relation in, 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 in that area. Second very quick point, um, China as a, as a technology um, uh, center already. So if you look at the value created uh, in high-tech high -tech manufacturing, China is already now um, um, just behind the United States. It's basically um, on par with the United States in terms of uh, a billion of billions of U.S. dollars in that sector. And for for all of the, the, of you and for all of us who have been to to Shenzhen and perhaps visited the headquarters of, of Huawei, fascinating experience, by the way. But if you go to Shenzhen, it's more than Huawei. It's really a technology center that is absolutely uh, fascinating. And so, so I, I really think. Uh, enhancing the collaboration in that area can be very, very interesting uh, for, for the European Union also. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Let's uh, do what we did in the last panel. Each one of you take one, one and a half minutes to respond to questions that were put directly to you or anything else, and maybe we'll do it in reverse order, uh, starting with the universities and you, Lawrence. The, uh, I, I actually agree with what Gunfram said completely, but I think the uh, the issue is actually very much to focus a little bit more on the value added in the high tech industries rather than the gross value. Because um, I mean, the Apple iPhone is a well known example. Yeah, the value added is very low, even the gross value is very high. Um, on the uh, rule of law issue, I, I don't have any disagreement. But I think that the compliance, voluntary compliance with the law, <laughs> is also partly cultural, partly environmental. And so you really cannot comply with the law when all your competitors are not complying. <laughs> I mean, that's suicidal, right? And uh, I'm not advocating you break the law, but I'm just saying that it depends on the environment. It also is partly cultural, partly depends on the enforcement, whether the government actually enforces uh, lots of laws on the books, but if they don't enforce the law, it's, it's hopeless. Uh, you know, so, so I don't disagree with you, but I think it is on the whole, I think it's improving on the whole. I mean, take uh, intellectual property right uh, uh, protection. I think it's really improved uh, quite a bit in the last few years. Yeah, on the, on the data storage um, issue, again, I think this is a very, very difficult uh, um, uh, question because I don't think at the moment that there is a, an, easy, an easy answer. Uh, the way that we as a company are um, approaching it, I mean, ideally we would like to see a free movement of uh, data because that I think would um, be providing us with an opportunity to better optimize our business processes, which I think every company would like to see. Unfortunately, that, this, that does not seem to be the case um, uh, at the moment. We are seeing uh, what's going on in Europe, uh, but equally in China and the, uh, and the US. So we, as a company, are trying to adapt to it. Uh, and obviously, we are an international company. We operate in different countries. And the way that we do it, obviously, we try to, well, we, we do comply with the law and regulation of each and every country that we operate in. This is the only way that we can do. It's not the ideal situation, unfortunately, because we would like to see harmonization globally. That's difficult to come. Uh, so we need to adapt, so it, because it, it, it comes down to us either being able to do business or not doing business. Uh, 
Um, so we need to adapt. I fear that uh, maybe our competitors have got exactly the same, um, the same view and probably the same challenges. Uh, but I, again, I think this is a, a discussion that we need to be taken at a global level. Because I, we do believe that there is a benefit in being able to share globally this amount of, uh, uh, of data. Maybe just one short uh, comment on rule of law. I think in China it really depends where you are. Um, so you can have a company in Beijing and everything's fine and then you are in a certain province and it's getting hard. Um, but I see a lot of improvement um, in this regard too because I think a lot of Chinese companies who are having high quality products, I mean every company um, is interested in uh, having a protection for their intellectual property. And we see that, that we get a lot, of, um, a lot of common understanding with our Chinese partners on the business level. So I think this is a rather good thing. Okay, very quickly. I, I could just make one last comment on, um, uh, on RPI, because I think this is a, uh, an important issue from our company perspective. Um, Huawei, as you rightly mentioned, is probably one of the leading company, and especially with new technology, 5G come in, will probably be having a substantial portfolio of um, uh, patent. The way that the company looks at patent, it's obviously as a way of, of us doing our business. But again, I think we are trying to shy away from the approach that we have seen adopted by other company. Because in the past, some company have used patent as a way of stopping or creating barrier to other company doing business. That's not our intention. We, obviously, we, will, we want to safeguard our investment but we will do in such a way that obviously we have a minimum amount of royalty, for example, but we will never be, we will never be stopping other company from doing uh, business. I mean, that's uh, our company philosophy. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and actually that last remark gives me an excuse to uh, round this off with uh, an anecdote which, which I was tempted to uh, uh, respond to uh, Larry's initial remarks with, but I think brings us all together. Uh, and it's an anecdote about the uh, value of international collaboration, particularly in science, but also of basic science, and uh, the significance of this whole debate about intellectual property, which is we, we, we've been uh, talking about. And really, Larry, it's a correction on something you said in your introduction, which is that CERN, which is this basic research institution, I don't know how many countries are involved, but well over 30 or 40 countries involved, are uh, doing nothing but basic research. You said they don't have a problem about intellectual property protection because everything they're doing is so far away from commercialization. And you gave the example of the Higgs boson, and I agree, I, I graduated in theoretical physics, I agree that's a long way from commercialization. But the example you didn't give, which is a much more important and significant one, is the World Wide Web, which was developed by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN. And the anecdote is, and I, I, I met Tim Berners-Lee, a few years ago and asked him that, about this. Why didn't CERN copyright HTTP, which was the basis of the World Wide Web? And what he said was, if we had done that, CERN would now be the largest corporation in the world, bigger than Apple, Google, and Amazon combined. But if we had done that, perhaps the World Wide Web would never have taken off. And I think that's a very interesting example of bringing all this together. Thank you very much.